Hi, I'm Carlin Borisenko. In early 2020, I was the knitting Democrat who accidentally went viral on the internet for going to a Trump rally and then left the party. I became the conservative darling, was on all the shows, traveled around the country, and then realized that conservatives were no better than Democrats. If there's one thing that I've learned, it's that both political tribes are two sides of the same coin. But it wasn't all bad. On my journey, I became obsessed with understanding the woke ideology and the culture war. I broke the story of the city of Seattle doing segregated training with its employees. How bad has this stuff become? The city of Seattle has now put out, I'm not kidding you. This is according to Dr. Carolyn Borisenko, who's an organizational psychologist. The city of Seattle asked its white employees to voluntarily spend a day off in a training about their internalized racial superiority. I broke the story that led to the first ever federal lawsuit against critical race theory in the schools. I broke the Coke Be Less White story, one of the biggest anti-woke stories of all time. It got over 30 million views. Coca-Cola's corporate headquarters even had to change their outgoing voicemail. Throughout the past few days, you may have seen inaccurate reporting on the content of our recently launched diversity, equity, and inclusion training program. I exposed the schools in Burlington, Vermont for grooming middle school children live on the internet. They called me an unwoke cult leader for that. And the Vermont Human Rights Commission slandered me publicly as being a hate channel. I even got called a hero in Breitbart for exposing that the Washington Post was writing a hit piece on Christopher Rufo. I have broken story after story after story about what's going on in the public schools, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, to autistic sex education, to the Department of Education in Michigan, literally training teachers all over the state how to groom children. I wrote a book called Actively Unwoke, the ultimate guide for fighting back against the woke insanity in your life. I host a podcast all about fighting back, and I'm downloading all of my knowledge to you on my Substack, carlin.substack.com. The world is a crazy place. We are literally surrounded by cults on all sides. On this show, we're going to do a deep dive into all aspects of the culture war, and I will show you the dark dystopian underbellies on both sides. Here are the commitments I'll make to you. I will always tell you the truth. I will always bring you receipts. And if you stick with me, I promise you will see the world differently. Welcome to the cult. Please mount that like button for me and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Well, hello, hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to The Cult. The Cult is a show that I do Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. on this very channel, as well as on Odyssey, Rockman, and Rumble, where we talk about all aspects of the culture where we do deep dives into the dystopia on both sides of the aisle. And then on Saturdays, we go live a little bit later at 6, at 6 o'clock p.m., where we do Socialism Saturday, where we watch the farthest left of the far left, and we're doing a little extra socialism this month, so don't be surprised if you see uh, random impromptu streams pop up here and there. But today's episode of The Cult is actually inspired by something that we stumbled upon last week. You see, if you are a member of my Substack, which is carlin.substack.com, K-A-R-L-Y-N, uh, and I'll put a ticker on the bottom of the screen just so you know how to spell my name. There we go. Last week, live on this channel, we accidentally stumbled upon this conference, Training Teachers to queer your kids. This was something that was, well, a little bit shocking when we found it on the channel, if I'm going to be honest. I did a little write-up for it for the Substack today. I've popped that link in the chat. You can also visit the Substack directly. Link's in the description on whatever platform you're watching on. And this conference is put on by an organization called A Queer Endeavor. A Queer Endeavor is out of the University of Colorado at Boulder. And they put on this conference every year called Educator Institute for Equity and Justice. And just in case you missed uh, last week's webinar, let me just read you some of the titles of the sessions from this conference, just so you can get a feel for what the teachers are learning. They're learning things like how and why we use diverse children's books to decolonize our classroom libraries by creating mirrors and windows into the lives and identities of our students. Respect 
that's what pronouns mean to me. An introduction to the use of gender neutral, neutral language. Showing up queer. Teachers as resistors. Bringing our lessons to the classroom. Turning swords into plowshares. Disarming white Christian supremacy for queer and trans liberation. Social justice in elementary mathematics classrooms. An intersectional approach. Don't you want your kids learning social justice in elementary school math? I knew you did. They've got You Are an Expert, opening dialogue around supporting LGBTQ plus elementary students. Let's practice queering your practice. Gender inclusive adaptations to your biology lessons. We'll talk more about that in a second. I don't know how biology isn't gender inclusive, but guess what? We're going to find out today. <laughs> They've got the queer library is open, the power of drag queen story time, and queering English language classrooms, initial queer considerations. And this is just but a few of the actual session titles that are being taught at this conference specifically targeted towards the people teaching your kids. But th th that's not the point today. That's not the point. The point is that when I was looking around a queer endeavors website, when I was doing this research, I was uh, I was scoping it out this morning and I, I found a couple interesting things. Toxic Male Gamer says, uh, keep it up. Thank you for the super chat, Toxic Male Gamer. I do appreciate it. I found a couple interesting things on this website. Now, first of all, I just want to point out, this is out of the University of Colorado Boulder, their school of education, which means, is there anyone here from Colorado today? Frank, thank you for signing up for my sub stack. I really do appreciate it. Is there anyone from Colorado? If you are from Colorado, congratulations. Your taxes are paying to fund this. I know you're just thrilled. So this is actually out of uh, a university, a college of education. I keep telling you guys the colleges of education are completely corrupt. Julie's paying for this. Congratulations, Julie. So I was trolling around their website and I went to this section called Educator Resources. And there's a lot of interesting things on this Educator Resources uh, website that we could probably spend, well, a long time going through. But as I was scrolling down past the gender support plans in the Colorado school districts, I noticed this. Curriculum. Gender inclusive biology. Let's click on that. Oh, there's a whole website about gender inclusive biology with lesson materials and educator guides and things that people can do because apparently in biology class now, it's not enough to teach that there are boys and there are girls. We have to teach all sorts of other things in order to be gender inclusive. And so I thought today, guys, for the uh, main segment of our stream and really most of what we're going to do today, I thought we would spend some time trolling around this website to see what we can find. I'm going into this pretty blind. I've looked around it just a little bit, but I haven't looked at a lot of it. And guess what, guys? There's lots of videos. We're going to watch some videos today. We're going we're gonna to learn about the origin of gender. We're going to learn about, um, about are there male and female brains? We're going to learn about the secrets of the X chromosome, intersex. I mean, we've got all sorts of stuff that we can watch today that is being taught to your children in biology class, not paid for by Julie anymore because she left. That was a good decision, Julie. <laughs> I just thought we'd have some fun. Anyone want to have some fun? Mount the like button if you want to have some fun looking at all this crazy stuff. We're going to spend some time looking around the website today, watching, uh, watching their videos, seeing exactly what your kids are learning when this stuff is being integrated into their curriculum as recommended by the University of Colorado School of Education. 
Nothing to see here, folks. Nothing to see here. So guys, please mount that like button for me if you are appreciative that I'm showing you this type of content. I'm pretty sure I'm one of the only people on the internet actually doing deep dives into this type of content. I do it because it needs to be elevated. People need to see what's going on because this type of stuff, you literally cannot believe what's happening until you actually take the time to look at it. And these are also tools that you guys can use for your friends and family, people in your community who are like, no, 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 they're not teaching that crazy stuff in school what are you talking about oh yes they are and i want to give you guys resources to be able to show no they are look at this website look at what they're saying look at what they're teaching look oh this is recommended from the university of colorado that's the whole purpose of doing this guys that's why we do what we do Shauna says, what's infuriating is my husband literally has Kleinfelters and trust me, the intersex community on average does not like this. I would imagine they don't, Shauna. I would imagine they don't. Just like most trans people, most trans people just want to be left alone. They just want to be able to live their lives and present how they want to present and show up in the world how they want to. And they just want basic respect and courtesy. They don't want any of this activism nonsense. But no, no, this is why we can't have nice things. The queer Marxist activists have to ruin everything. But guys, before we get into that, I've got a couple orders of business. Number one, please do make sure while you're over on my Substack reading this article about the training that teachers are undergoing to learn how to queer your kids, please make sure you subscribe to my Substack. My Substack is my content hub. It is where I put all my best stuff. It is the number one place that you can go to find out and do deep dives into the actual content and curriculum that your kids are seeing. I cover all sorts of different things about what's going on in the world, about the woke ideology, trying to break it down, explain it to you in the easiest possible terms that I can. You can really help me out, not only by becoming a free subscriber today, which I would recommend everyone do, but by becoming a paying member of my Substack because my work is entirely 100% funded by you. I do not take money from organizations. I do not take money from people with political interests, because one of the things that I have learned over the past three years is that if you take money from an organization or anyone that has a political bias in any sort of way, they will expect to own you. They will expect to use you. They will expect you to parrot their talking points. And I'm not about that. I'm going to tell you guys the truth, whether it falls down on the left or the right or somewhere in between, I don't really care, but I'm going to tell you guys the truth and I will always, 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 always provide you with receipts where you can double check and then make the decision for yourself. I am not pandering to the right. I'm not pandering to the left. I think both sides are crazy. And that means that I need my funding to come from the grassroots from you guys. So if you can help me out by signing up for five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year, that would be great. If you don't want to sign up on Substack, that's cool, man. You can join my locals community. You can sign up on Patreon. You can even make a one-time gift over on activelyunwoke.com slash support. I do give you all sorts of nice perks when you do that. You can find out more by looking at this article right here, four ways you can support my unwoke activism. And I really do appreciate it, guys. I do newsletters out to you, letting you know what I've covered, making sure everyone's caught up. And, uh, you know, I think we do a pretty good job of it. Um, another thing I wanted to announce is I do have, of course, my unwoke art sub stack, and I do have a new design in the sub stack. Now, everyone knows I'm not voting for Trump. I refuse. I'm not voting for Trump. However, can we all just admit that Trump is hilarious? Can we all just admit that Trump, I mean, it's just not, it's just not an election cycle. <laughs> it's just not an election cycle without Donald Trump in it. I mean, it's so boring. And Trump has had some wins lately. Trump, of course, had an epic victory over uh, CNN in the town hall. Well, it should have been a town hall, but really was a debate with a moderator last week. Trump did really well in that. Trump uh, Trump basically destroyed CNN live on CNN, which was pretty great. And then yesterday with the Durham report coming out, Trump got, well, pretty exonerated from several years of bullshit that he had to undergo <laughs> in terms of like the Russia hoax and all that. Basically, they hijacked his entire presidency with that. And Trump always comes out on top. Whether you love him or whether you hate him, he always comes out on top. So I had to. I had to make a design 
that was just for Trump, even though I'm not going to vote for him, but we can all enjoy him. And I do actually have a very soft spot in my heart for Trump. Come on. And so I made this uh, design for Unwoke Art. Always get the last laugh with Trump. This is a special limited edition design that you can find in the Unwoke Art store. And of course, I put everything on gold, baby. Everything is on gold. We got a gold t-shirt. This mug is probably my favorite thing that I've ever designed. We'll come back to that in a second. I've got stickers. I've got this really nice G clay print. This is a super nice quality print, guys. Like G clay is like, it's going to, the colors are going to pop. It's going to be really high quality. It's not going to be some flimsy like paper thingy. It's really, really good. Um, So that's going to look great. But like, let's talk about this mug because I have been waiting and biding my time to put something on the gold metallic mug. I have I knew this product was available. I I wanted to find something that was appropriate for the golden mug and you just can't get more Trump <laughs> than putting him on a gold mug. I mean, come on, it looks great. And of course the white in the design fades away and then we got the gold coming through so Trump is literally made out of gold on this mug. I just love it. I don't know guys, this stuff just tickles me. I love making the designs for Unwoke Art. It is really like it's so fun, it's so creative. I hope you guys are enjoying it. And of course all your purchases from the merch store whether it's like for yourself or for a gift or something like that um it, it really does it goes to support the work i'm doing and keep me in business and so i really do appreciate it and and i love it when people get the merch because it means that i can spend my time doing some creative things when i'm not pulling the rest of my hair out over this curriculum and stuff like that so you can find that over on unwokeart.com right now while you are in my art store, you can uh, you can find all sorts of cool merch. Of course, we got the limited edition Trump stuff right up at the top. But I've got stickers. I've got all sorts of T-shirts. I've got hoodies. I've got mugs and water bottles. I've got prints. I've got all sorts of great stuff in the store that you can find. And um, I've made all the designs. So I and I really enjoy doing it. So thank you guys for allowing me to show you show it off. <clears throat> all right. What else do we have? Oh. As a reminder, on Tuesdays, this is not my last stream of the day. This is but my first stream of the day. And if you've never joined us for Nothing Remotely Controversial with Joshua at 930, it's a nice little break. It's a vacation from the news. Well, not really, because Joshua is a professional psychic and we talk about the news and whatever and whatever else is going on in the world. And Jen, then Joshua uses his tarot card magic to help us peer beneath the surface and predict what's going to happen. Joshua is freakishly accurate. And even if you don't believe in psychics or tarot cards or any of those things, you don't have to. You can just come hang out and enjoy. We have a really good time with it. All right, guys, with those things out of the way, let's take a gander around gender inclusive biology. And I am really doing this blind. I don't really know what's on this website besides a couple things that I've looked at. Um, and so let's just let's just uh, troll around a little bit. Now let's go into graphics, models, and diagrams. And we'll see. Um, and this is one of the things that I did look at. So I do want to show you guys this. Check this out. Did you guys know that nature is queer? This is an infographic that they are using with your kids in school. Nature is queer. Gender and sexual diversity exist throughout the natural world in many different organisms. Gender diversity in nature. Non-binary fungi. Rather than obeying the male-female binary, some fungi have thousands of different sexes. This allows them to reproduce with almost every other individual of the same species they encounter. So, remember, the goal of queer Marxism is to eliminate the gender binary. They want to eliminate men. They want to eliminate women. They want a world full of days. And now they're saying, but mushrooms are all non-binary. Therefore, we can all be non-binary too. We don't have to obey it. Alexa says, the live stream didn't come up for me in YouTube, but I'm here. Well, welcome, Alexa. Guys, just so you know, I do have a substack called The Cult. It's thecult.substack.com. You can find a link to it in the, in the description below. And that is my way of getting around the fact that YouTube doesn't notify you guys. So if you sign up, and it is totally free, if you sign up for a subscription, I will email you before the show saying, here's what I'm talking about today. And you can decide if you want to come or not. But 
you know, can't can't rely on YouTube. Transgender clownfish. Clownfish are born with both sets of reproductive organs. When the dominant female in the community of clownfish dies, her male mate will change sex in order to take her place in the hierarchy. An intersex slug. Slugs have two different sets of genitalia, and when they mate, both are used simultaneously well. It kind of makes you look at slugs a little bit differently, doesn't it? That means that both individuals can be fertilized and any two members of the same species can mate. Sexual diversity in nature. A lesbian marmot. Female or ornery and Olympic marmots often engage in different sexual and affectionate behaviors with other females, especially when they are in heat. Asexual whiptail. The New Mexico whiptail is an all-female species of lizard. They reproduce asexually through a process called parthenogenesis that bypasses the need for fertilization by males. And then, of course, the gay penguins. Bonded pairs of male penguins have been observed since 1911. And then they conclude the infographic with people are nature too. Though we may view ourselves as separate from nature, people are a part of the natural world. And queerness is just as natural in humans as it is in other organisms. There is a wide spectrum of gender and sexual identities in people just as in nature. And all of them are worthy of love and respect. So go live your best queer life and remember that nature is on our side. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the infographic for Nature is Queer in Gender Inclusive Biology. Isn't that nice? And this was developed by Theo, a graduate student working on his Master's of Education at the University of Washington. Never let them tell you that the schools of education are not totally corrupted. Well, this is a good question. If nature is on our side, then why do we need drugs and surgery? Really good question there. Let's go back. Let's see what else they have. Sex diversity in nature. Let's take a look for that. Generating a framework for uh, gender and sexual diversity and inclusive STEM education. Glisten. Glisten is crazy. There's more than one way to make a family. Let's see. That's good. A brief exploration of sex diversity in the natural world. The queer sex ed community curriculum is an LGBTQ led project that is developing inclusive trauma informed and sex positive resources for work with youth. Their resource library includes zines, posters, training materials that you can implement in your classroom. Let's go and see. Oh. Medicalization of queerness. A zine exploring the history of patholog pathologization of queer people. Oh, go away. To be or not to be gendered. A zine exploring the phenomenon of having a gender as an interact. What is this? How does someone become a gender? There are two competing ideas. Essentialism, the idea that one's gender is biologically predetermined. Or social constructivism, the idea of one's gender is constructed throughout their lives and determined in part by the individual and in part by the cultures that they exist in. Gender expression, gender attribution, and gender identity. Gender is an interaction between three components. Oh, is it really? Your gender is an interaction between these three components. Is that the same thing that Glisten is teaching? Yep, that's exactly the same thing that Glisten is teaching. Attribution, how you're perceived by others. Expression, how you present yourself. And body, how your body exists and changes. What did what did he say? Does he does does Richard Dawkins support this? No. Gender is fluid. Gender expression, gender attribution, and gender identity 
tend to change over time. So they're basically saying that everyone is gender fluid. Congratulations. You're all gender queer now. How does everyone feel with this revelation that you're really queer? As these components of someone's gender shift and evolve, their gender changes too. Cisgender attribution. Gender attribution is the idea that gender is externally imposed, meaning the way that others read someone influences their gender. Gender attribution is affected by the culture you live in, how others perceive you, and so on. In our cisgenderist culture, I didn't know we lived in a cisgenderist culture, but okay. In a cisgenderist culture, binary genders are typically the only options. Therefore, most Folks, I'm really disappointed. I'm really disappointed that we didn't get a good old FOLX. They don't even know their own ideology. Therefore, most folks are automatically attributed to either the masculine or feminine categories. That leaves no space for transgender and gender nonconforming identities to be publicly acknowledged. We don't get accurate trans narratives. As a result of cultural cisgenderism, that's a queer Marxist term if I've ever heard one, trans narratives are often inaccessible to trans and cis people alike. The stories that we do receive about trans people are often misrepresented, depressing, or violent. Without trans visibility, young people don't get to see their experiences represented, which can lead to feelings of isolation and confusion. Language and gender. Many young trans people's identity epiphany occurs when they first access stories of trans experiences. Oh! So are you guys telling me that teenagers go onto the internet and they start to read about other teenagers feeling different and they're like, I feel different too. Maybe I'm just like them. Are you telling me they go onto Tumblr and they see all sorts of graphics and things and they get sucked into it? I think they might be. Vocabulary affects your gender identity. You can't become what you don't know. This is what people mean when they say trans visibility saves lives. Well, no, that's not exactly what they mean, but okay. That didn't explain to me to be gendered or not to be gendered. That didn't really, that was not a deep dive. I feel very, I feel very let down by that. Maybe we'll read another one. Cultural cisgenderism. What's this? A deep dive into cultural cisgenderism. A zine exploring how cultural cisgenderism creates and curates our conception of sex and gender. I am not trapped by my body. I am trapped by my beliefs. Uh Uh-oh. Richard Dawkins, not a Marxist, an asshole maybe. He is. He's an arrogant dick. Let's just be honest about it. He can be very smart and also be an arrogant dick. But at least he's not a Marxist. So, you know, we got to take what we can get. Beggars can't be choosers. Oh, Prancing Alien, thank you for the super chat. Been a long-time viewer, but only recently started watching Socialism Saturdays, and this is my first cult live. Everyone welcome Prancing Alien. It all feels so exhausting and blackpilling, but I just wanted to say thanks for all you do, and your community is awesome. Well, yeah, I try to keep it fun. I try to keep it lighthearted. I try to keep it a little bit, you know, a little bit. It it can be blackpilling. Like, let's not front, guys. It can be really blackpilling, but we have to choose how we approach this, and if we can find some humor in it, it can it can lighten the load a little bit. And of course, we try to create a fun environment in the community. I'm really glad you made it. And thank you for tuning in and watching Socialism Saturday as well, which is honestly the most important thing that anyone can watch on this channel, I think. A study by Kennedy and Helen, 2010, found that the vast majority, 90 to 95 percent, of trans children's identity is not known by their parents, teachers, or other adults in the community. Let's see. The statistic, which feels both astounding and unsurprising, led researchers to ask, why do these children conceal or suppress their sex and gender nonconformity? Guys, blackpilling is essentially when 
when things seem rather hope hopeless. So if you're feeling really down and you're like, life sucks and then you die and the world is crazy and it's never getting any, any better and everything is awful and everyone is awful, that's black pilling. We don't want it's it's natural to be to, to, to be in a black pilled place every once in a while, but we don't want to spend our lives there. The opposite of that is going to be white pill, which is there is hope. And even though hope might sometimes seem a long way off, we still want to try to to find the light at the end of the tunnel when we can. Researchers found that cultural cisgenderism is to be the at the heart of the issue. Cultural cisgenderism is the idea that there is a biological distinction between cis and trans folks. It is the idea that cisgender identities are the norm and transgender identities are deviant from the norm or the other. Cultural cisgenderism is a largely held but rarely stated ideology. It is implicit and it is everywhere. We can see the effects of the ideology in the systemic erasure and problematizing of trans people. The ideology creates the common misunderstanding that sex and gender are predetermined and unchangeable. So so all those people on Twitter, they're like, there are men and there are women. If you believe there are only two genders, you are guilty of cultural cisgenderism. Everyone tracking? It's important when we learn new words that we just make sure we instill the meaning of those ideas of those words into our heads. Well, they don't want trans to be deviant from the norm, though. Here's the thing about queer Marxism. Queer Marxism, by the way, in queer Marxism, trans does not mean transition. It does not mean going from male to female. It means transform. Okay? So it's basically about becoming something else, something that is not male, non-female. They, they do not want trans to be deviant from the norm. They want trans to be the norm. They want to get rid of the gender binary entirely. They want a whole world of days. So that's why they create materials like this to basically say, this is part of the norm and that's bad. And we have to break outside of the norm. How does cultural cisgenderism affect children? By eliminating the trans narratives, cultural cisgenderism erases the possibility of other sexes and genders existing in the minds of young people. It effectively creates a sort of isolating gendered tunnel vision. Young trans children often struggle with the illusion of singularity or the belief that they are the only person that has ever felt this way. Without access to trans narratives, trans children cannot ground their personal experiences in any community or history. Problematizing transness. Cultural cisgenderism problem problematizes transness, turning it into an affliction rather than an identity. Our culture often demands an explanation for transness since we view it as deviant from the norm. This sends the message to young people that there is something wrong with them that needs to be fixed. There is nothing biologically or psychologically wrong with young trans people. Well, some people might disagree with that. Now, no one is saying they're bad people. No one is saying they are unworthy of love and affection and respect and consideration. But to say there's not something that's, you know, off is simply not correct. I'm sorry. It's not correct. What is the difference between cisgenderism and transphobia? Are cis... Oh, check this out. Our cisgenderist culture works like an incubator for transphobia. Cultural cisgenderism makes trans people systematically invisible. In a society where cisgenderism is considered the norm, transphobia can flourish unchecked. So basically they're saying, guys, that if you believe that there are men and women, then you're transphobic. Or you are at the very least incubating transphobia. Isn't that nice? Cisgenderism affects cis people too. 
cultural cisgenderism creates and reinforces rigid gender stereotypes. No, it doesn't. These people create and enforce rigid gender stereotypes. Men shouldn't cry or express emotions. Women should want children and stay in the home. Even for cis people, the idea that one is born to fulfill certain gender roles can feel restrictive and uncomfortable. Who is this Kennedy person? That is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Mighty Pancake, we're doing queer biology today. This is queer biology. We don't follow cisgender biology. This is queer biology, bro. Oh, that's it. All right. That's all for that zine. Let's go back. Trans. Oh, this sounds like a good one, guys. The trans youth moral panic debunked. Let's see. This is great. What a great find. A zine debunking the anti-trans moral panic. Contents. Panic at the intersections of media and identity, early dysphoria, and trans children coming out as an ongoing process. The super debunked assistance myth. Rapid onset gender dysphoria, also debunked. Trans screen birth and political visibility. Vocabulary acquisition and community are hot take. And this is also inspired by that Kennedy person that we just saw in the last one. Texas's recent anti-trans legislation is fueled by a moral panic in right-wing media, which claims that trans youth are threatening to American lives. Well, no, it doesn't actually claim that at all. I would never have characterized it like that, but that's just me. The idea relies on the concept of trans youth as passive victims to their gender identity. In other words, this idea claims that transness is a kind of social disease and that children can catch and spread. I don't think that that's anything that anyone has said, but okay. Yeah, bot, can you find this Kennedy person? Is bot here? We need our chief investigative officer, like, on the job. The moral panic has deep roots in the history of LGBTQIA plus people being criminalized, institutionalized, and pathologized as a way of correcting or protecting society from their sexualities and identity identities. The super oh bot is driving. Damn it, bot. Fine. That's okay. We'll find him later. The super debunked desistance myth. The desistance myth is the false underlined, bold, claim that the majority of trans children do not become trans adults. The myth is based on a discredited, bold, study that relied on flawed methods, bold, and falsified data, also bold. I mean, I love how they're giving us absolutely no evidence. Isn't it great that in this, they're just making assertions. They're like, it was wrong and it was false and it had flawed methodologies. Trust us, bro. Trust us. We wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> in reality, less than 4% of trans children detransition. I don't think that's, I don't think that's scientific. I could be wrong. Maybe there are studies that say that, but I don't think that's scientific. And there is nothing wrong with detransitioning. Gender identity is fluid and always changing. Well, I mean, it's interesting because I was looking at uh, Prisha's social media. Prisha is one of the detransitioners that's been traveling around the country testifying for all these bills. I was looking at Prisha's social media and Prisha gets a lot of harassment for detransitioning. So maybe they should teach some of their trans activists to, you know, not harass people who are who are simply detransitioning. Crazy idea. Studies and stories and autobiographies all suggest that trans children experience gender dysphoria before they have the words for it. Tacit deferral. The time before the trans epiphany decursive deferral, the time before the trans epiphany and coming out, and epiphany, the transition between tacit and decursive deferral. Rapid onset gender dysphoria, also debunked. Rapid onset gender dysphoria is a highly criticized pathology that describes a very short time span between epiphany and coming out. 
teachers and parents need to understand that while a child coming out as trans may seem su- sudden to them, the likelihood is that in one way or another, they have understood themselves to be trans for a significant period of time and experienced gender dysphoria for considerably longer than that. Hey, Gabs, Gabs, Gabs is in the chat. Gabs, I have a question. When your daughter experienced rapid onset gender dysphoria, did, did had they had 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 she understood herself to be trans for a significant period of time before she came out? I'm just curious <laughs> if if this is scientifically backed up by someone whose daughter actually tried to transition. We'll give Gabs a second to answer that, guys. In the meantime, please mount that like button for me. No, she didn't have that. (laughs) Coming out is an ongoing process. Trans adults report recognizing their trans identity at a young age, but face a cultural barrier that makes it difficult and sometimes dangerous to come out. The societal barrier is known as cultural cisgenderism. Cultural cisgenderism is the common but rarely articulated cultural practice of passive discrimination against trans people. The other barriers lengthen and complicate the coming out process for many trans people. They've got vocab. Oh, good. Nathan says, proud conservative here who values your work, Dr. K. Thank you, Nathan. I do appreciate that. Our hot take. Queer and trans representation is increasing. In turn, trans language and vocabulary are more available than ever before. Accordingly, young trans people are able to access and identify with these terms in greater numbers. Okay, so here's their theory as to why more kids are trans than ever before. It's not that they're picking up on social cues from their friends. It's not that there's a social contagion. It's that they're just hearing the vocabulary, and in hearing the vocabulary, they're able to identify things in themselves that they just weren't able to identify before they had the vocabulary, because more people in schools, like their teachers in biology class, are teaching them the vocabulary, and that's allowing them to identify themselves as trans. Everyone on board? The passive victim narrative assumes that young trans people have no agency. However, studies suggest the opposite. Young trans people actively participate in their own identity construction. It's not just something that happens to them. And then sources. Well, there are the sources there. I'm not going to do a deep dive into all those sources. I'll tell you that right now. Kennedy is Natasha, N-A-T-A-C-H-A, so it's a woman. All right, well, that's a good one. Let's go back. Oh, anti-fat bias in the queer community. That might be a fun one to read sometime. Sex, diversity, and nature. There we go, queer biology. Yes, that's the one, bot. You got her. That's the one. Sex diversity in nature. A brief exploration of sex diversity in the natural world. What is biological sex? In biology, male and female are minor and often inconsequential categories. Yes, I consider male and female to be highly inconsequential myself. The definition of male is something that produces small gametes. The definition of female is something that produces large gametes. Okay, so everyone from now on, instead of saying you are a man, you have to say you are a person who produces small gametes. And if you're a woman, you have to say a person that produces large gametes. Does everyone understand? I didn't make the rules. That's it. All other behavior and anatomy is not necessarily correlated to biological sex. Clownfish can switch between being male and female. We talked about them earlier. If a female clownfish is removed from the sea, uh, 
anema, a male clownfish will turn into a female and begin producing eggs. Oh, Natasha is trans. I know I'm shocked that the most cited researcher on the trans studies is also trans. The blue head, I don't know how to say that word. They have three sexes, males, females, and females minus greater than male. Okay. Marine mammals. Male dolphins and whales have internal genitalia, internal testes, and no scrotum, and an internal genital slit. A goby. Gobies switch back and forth between sexes. Well, that must be very confusing. 80% of juveniles mature into females and then switch to male at some point in their life and then switch back. Bears? How can bears be non-binary? Did everyone know that bears were non-binary? 10 to 20% of female population have external genitalia or a birth canal that runs through a penis. This can be found in grizzly bears, American black bears, and polar bears. Victor, my husband, has been on a kick lately about watching YouTube videos of, like, bear encounters. And so I'm going to be really excited to inform him that bears are (laughs) non-binary. He's going to be thrilled. (laughs) Be like, Victor, that that bear you watched in that video that that, chased that guy up the tree? Non-binary. Deer. Many types of deer have intersexed individuals. Yeah, I mean, what like what gender was cocaine bear? The mysteries never end. Velvet horns males have small antlers and doe-like features and smell th- and small testes. They can be found in white-tailed deer, black-tailed deer, elk, swamp deer, sika deer, roe deer, fallow deer, and moose. Kangaroo rat. As many as 16% of kangaroo rats have both sperm and egg-producing abilities. Some individual kangaroo rats have a vagina, a penis, testes, and a uterus all in one. Hyenas. Both male and female hyenas have almost identical penises. Female hyenas give birth through external genitalia. Primates. Male and female have both external genitalia, i.e. a clitoris, and penis that look almost indistinguishable. Guys, just as a a reminder, this is what they're teaching kids in school. I'm literally reading something they're teaching kids in school. Just to, like, this is not, you know, this is not a nature magazine or anything. (laughs) That's it. That's it. That's That's where queer nature ends. All right, let's go back. God, there's so many different things we can look at. But I want to go back and watch some videos. Okay, I want to go watch some videos. Those are some some lessons. I want to watch some videos for students. Let's see. What videos do we want to watch? Let me make sure I have the sound set up. And remember, guys, if you just joined us, we are looking at queer biology lessons that are actually being taught to kids. This is a website that I found through the University of Colorado School of Education. So they are quite literally recommending this website through colleges of education. So not just some rinky dink site I found on the dark corner of the internet. Let's watch The Origin of Gender. I feel like that's a really good place to start. Let's see what they, oh, from PBS. Excellent. Let's see what they have to say. Are male and female the only two genders, and when do we start associating gender with certain roles in society? When I hear the word binary, my mind immediately jumps to gender and 80s movies about computers. And that's because outside of meaning something that has two sides or two parts, binary is often linked to the concept that there are two genders in the world, and every person falls- Hang on guys, I'm trying to get this video to actually go full screen, and it's just not cooperating with me, so let me give him one sec here. Let me get the captions up. 
are male and female the only there two genders? And when do we start associating gender with certain roles in society? When I hear the word binary, my mind immediately jumps to gender and 80s movies about computers. And that's because outside of meeting something that has BBS. two sides or two parts, binary is often linked to the concept that there are two genders in the world and every person falls squarely into one of these two categories. And since lots of you Origin of Everything fans write in with questions and comments about things related to gender and gender norms, I wanted to spend this week getting down into an abbreviated history of how we got to the idea of binary gender, what the heck some of the differences between gender and sex are, how those two categories became linked, and why we started associating different tasks in society along the gender divide, with certain behaviors being ascribed to masculinity and others to femininity. Okay, so we have a lot to cover and very little time, but the natural place to start here seems to be, what is gender? And how does it differ from sex? So to start things off in something of an order, from concrete to abstract, human sex is usually linked to biological and physical traits of the body. These can include reproductive organs, hormones, chromosomes, with the old wisdom being that XX chromosomes signal females while XY chromosomes are indicative of males, outward appearance of the genitalia, and secondary sex characteristics, which kick in around puberty for humans. These traits include things like growing breasts, getting hairy, or producing all of that lovely oil and grease that makes our pits stink and our T-zones shine bright like a diamond. Although these are the ways that sex is determined or identified, it also involves a fair bit of fluidity. For example, there are people who are intersex, meaning that they share a variety of these traits across the sexual divide. People can have XX chromosomes associated with women, but present in most other ways as male and vice versa. It's also possible to have a mixture of these traits that aren't easily quantifiable and don't align neatly with male or female designations. Although in some of these cases, there are parents and healthcare providers who choose an assigned sex for a child born with a mixture of traits at birth. But while sex is mostly considered biological, gender is its more loosely defined cousin. Gender relates to the performance of roles, identities, and ideas surrounding masculine, feminine, or neutral traits. I just want to do a quick pause to remind everyone that this is produced by PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service, which is funded by our taxes. And more often than not, we link gender to both outward behaviors and internal ideas about ourselves. A good example of performing gender in society I agree. would be a statement like, all girls' favorite color is pink. The first assumption is that girl lines up with female sex, and the second is that given the choice, most, if not all, girls will not only choose pink as their favorite color, but will also be naturally predisposed to liking pink over other colors. But this idea confuses cultural conditioning with a presumed biological determinism. And if you want more on pink for girls and blue for boys, then this is the perfect time to hop on over to our video on gender clothing for a deeper explanation. Gen she just said that there's no biological predeterminism. I just wanted to, they, they, they glossed right over it. I just wanted to make sure everyone heard it. Yes, this is for kids. Steven, this is queer biology. I know you're going to be thrilled. Gender also blossoms outward into other areas of our lives and is often used as a measure for sexual desire, behavior, and societal roles. We also apply gender pretty widely and often, even to concepts and inanimate objects, more so than biological sex. Take, for example, some Indo-European languages like Spanish, German, and Latin, where gender is used to conjugate certain verbs or attached to nouns and pronouns. So while both sex and gender are not hard and fast across the board, both are more often than not linked together and then described to us using two choices, male sex aligning with masculine gender and female sex aligning with feminine gender. But while the concept of two sexes and two genders is ingrained in us as the cultural norm, this hasn't always been universally true. That leads us to our next question. What are the alternatives to the binary gender model. Well, in fact, outside of the West, Here's many cultures we get our and Marxism. countries have a history that recognizes either gender fluidity or gender categories that exist beyond the binary. Prior to colonization, the Incas worshipped a dual-gendered god, whose attendants, the Kuriwarmi, wore androgynous clothing and represented a third gender space. Among the Sakalavas of Madagascar, boys who were considered feminine in appearance were raised as girls and believed to have supernatural protection that prevented them from being harmed. In Hawaii, Kanaka Malawi indigenous societies had the 
Mahu, who could be aligned with any biological sex, but expressed a gender role that was in between masculine and feminine. And the Bernicia of Albania are women feminine. who have sworn a vow of chastity and dress as men, a tradition that dates back as far as the 1400s, although their numbers have dwindled dramatically in recent years. So the concept of more than two why. genders has existed and still exists worldwide. But concepts of biological sex and gender could be fluid also existed in parts of Western Europe. Prior to the 18th century and the rise of Enlightenment thinking in Europe, there was a theory that men and women's reproductive organs could belong to a common sex. Oh, even shit. Did you guys hear that? That was so subtle, but she just attacked the Enlightenment. She attacked Enlightenment thinking. She was like, prior to the Enlightenment thinking in Europe, they thought that people could could be gender fluid and gender queer. I want to rewind that because I think that that's really important. I mean, a lot of people argue that one of the things these people are trying to do is attack Enlightenment values. And I do agree with that to a certain extent. I think it's actually much deeper than that. But I mean, this is a direct example of them attacking the Enlightenment. So let's let's rewind and listen again. Check this out also existed in parts of Western Europe. Prior to the 18th century and the rise of Enlightenment thinking in Europe, Finger there was a theory that men and women's reproductive organs could belong to a common sex, even though they were assigned to different gendered roles. So there was one sex, but two genders. In the second century AD, Greek physician Galen noted, turn outward the woman's, turn inward, so to speak, and fold double the man, and you will find the same in both in every respect. That's right. He was of the opinion that women were essentially size. men with penises that had been flipped up inside of their bodies and not fully developed, and vice versa on the male side of things. Which isn't so kooky when you consider that physicians at that time also believed that women's female hysteria was caused by wandering wombs. And while this wasn't a universally held belief, the idea that male and female reproductive organs were somehow two sides of the same coin persisted until the Renaissance. And just like class, gender was given a hierarchy and attached to ideas about inequality. Qualities. So someone of high birth was considered inherently better than someone from a lower class. And the same went with gender, which valued masculine traits and behaviors over all else. And the category of gender was also linked with emerging categories such as race and long held beliefs like class. So white male or masculine folks of high birth placed themselves at the top of the pyramid and created complex systems that trickled outward from that center point. But that doesn't mean that there weren't alternatives that existed across complex societies prior to colonization. With the dawn of Enlightenment thinking and the resulting bingo uprisings word. around the world, think American Revolution, Haitian Revolution, and the French Revolution, to name a few, we start to see language about the rights of man that looked to upset one key part of the hierarchy, class as it was associated with free voting white men. Class that had been entrenched in societies that held up an aristocracy based on rank and high birth had a major upset. But all of this language about men having rights wasn't thinking of the universal term of man, meaning all human beings as it was in the past, but rather specifically linked to race, gender, and sex. So what? it's in the 18th and 19th century that we start to see a further codification of these accepted binaries, even though concepts of them existed prior to this point. According to Alberto Alcina, Paolo Giuliano, wow. and Nathan Nunn in their article on the origins of gender roles, women in the planet. They basically just argued that that the that the the American Revolution reinforced the gender like was like one of the origins of like today's gender binary. How crazy. Uh, some of this may be broken down to the assignment of labor roles. They found that, consistent with existing hypotheses, the descendants of societies that traditionally practice plow agriculture today have less equal gender norms, measured using reported gender role attitudes and female participation in the workplace, politics, and entrepreneurial activities. So societies that spread more traditional agricultural roles as a whole had less gender equality and leaned towards a belief that men and women occupy different spheres than those that did not. It comes as no surprise then that with the rise of colonization, which often looked to regulate and standardize farming practices across different regions, that we also see a solidification of gender roles becoming the norm. Exactly, this is also actually. coupled with the fact that often people in colonized exactly. regions were severely punished for expressing any gender, sex, or sexual expression outside of the accepted norm of two genders and two sexes. But the word gender started circulating in academic discourse and broader cultural discussions around the midpoint of the 20th century as everyday people began to push back openly and critically about the role that gender played in their lives. We see all of these conversations about gender and gender norms playing crucial roles in the movements for LGBTQIA rights and visibility, civil rights, and feminist critique. 
So how does it all add up? While this episode was kind of a tall order and gender is a massive and complex topic, I hope this gave a rough sketch to start your search process and enliven your debates. There are a lot of other trains I could have covered, like gender and religion, or gender and class, or gender and class and religion and race and even more labor, but condensed it here for time. So it still bears repeating that this is just one of many threads in the story, and gender is still circulating in our everyday lives from which color you paint your newborn's bedroom to which box we check off for our licenses at the DMV. So what do you think? Anything to add to my binary gender timeline? Drop those comments down below and I'll see- Oh, so, 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 so much to add. All right, guys. Well, again, that was from PBS, The Origins of Gender. I'd like everyone's reactions in the chat, please. And uh, while you guys are putting your uh, reactions in, I'm just going to check in on the other platforms I'm streaming on and thank people for watching on Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, other places. Let me just check in on Rumble real quick. Got a bunch of people watching over there. American Legends over there. Sith is over there. Yeah. Let's, let's, Let's take a look at the comments. I mean, the medieval stuff about penises and vaginas being the same thing developed differently is not very far off than what we know about prenatal development. Indeed, emphasize. Indeed, indeed. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. An informative video, but it did not explain the origin of uh, gender as a concept. So I'm not getting much from the uh, comments here, I have to say. Yeah, this is what your kids are watching in biology class. Congratulations. All right, let's go back. We've got lots of other videos here. What do I, what you guys, we can watch a TED Talk. The way we think about biological sex is wrong. I'd like to watch this one. There are more than two human sexes. This SciShow video summarizes the complexity of human determinism, which is often wrongly thought to be binary. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce any of those words, so we're just going to go right into it. Maybe they'll pronounce the words in the video. Hang on. I'm going to pause it until we can get it full screen so everyone can see it. Oh, 1.5 million views. Excellent. Nothing to see here, guys. It's not like it has 1.5 million views or anything to teach your kids queer biology. Come on, full screen, full screen. Not asking too much, YouTube. Why isn't it working? Full screen. There it goes. Yay. In high school biology, we usually learn that the sexes in humans are fixed and concrete. Whether you're male or female is black and white and rooted in your DNA. Your 23rd pair of chromosomes is either two X chromosomes or an X and a Y. That's it. End of story. And that's essentially what scientists thought too. But it turns out that sex isn't that straightforward. In fact, biologists today are saying sex is a spectrum. And the scientific community is still no, working on wait, understanding. Wait, wait, excuse me. What did he just say? Biologists today are saying that sex is a spectrum. Hang on. I'm not sure that biologists are actually saying that. Oh, yep. Look at that. In fact, biologists today are saying sex is a spectrum. I'm just going to grab a screenshot of that, guys. Don't, uh, don't mind me. Isn't it funny? Bio- how many biologists are saying that exactly and precisely? Armani, thank you for the super chat. All of their supposed proof of gender being more than binary is rooted in a culture's disdain of gay people. If you're gay in these cultures, you're relegated into another class. It's regressive. Yeah, of course it is. All of this, all of this shit is designed to reinforce gender stereotypes. They want the stereotypes to exist. These people would not be able to convince anyone of anything if the stereotypes did not exist. 
saying sex is a spectrum. And the scientific community is still working on understanding and respecting the people who fall in the middle of that spectrum. To get this out of the way right up front, we're not talking about gender or sexuality here. Gender refers to social and cultural attributes and understandings of men and women and their roles, though not every culture has only two categories and it's increasingly seen as a spectrum. Plus, the gender you identify as may or may not be the same one as what you express with things like your clothing and behavior. All of of which can also be on a spectrum. Sexuality describes who you are attracted to, and it can be equally complicated and on a spectrum, and where you are on these spectrums isn't necessarily fixed. What we are talking about today is your biology, including your chromosomes, your hormones, your gonads, and your genitals. The catch is that these biological features don't always agree with each other. And they certainly don't always conform to those high school health class diagrams that tell us there's a single, universally correct pathway to being male and female. In fact, it's estimated that nearly 2% of live births are born with congenital conditions of atypical sex development. That basically means that something in their chromosomes, hormones, gonads, or genitals is different from what many people expect of a boy or a girl. This used to be known as being intersex, but these days it's better described as having differences of sexual development, or DSDs. And while nearly 2% might not sound like a these lot, it means that there could be That's 130 exactly right. million people or more with DSDs. If all those people were in one country, it would be among the top 10 most populous countries in the world. Plus, DSDs are not always something you can see. People can spend their whole lives thinking they're one sex based on anatomy, me, only to find at least part of them exactly. tells a different story. Um, you see, your sex your is the result of both sexual determination and sexual differentiation. Sexual determination has to do with what chromosomes you get. Those largely determine what happens to your body during sexual differentiation, the process by which you develop the physiological characteristics associated with your sex. And contrary to what you might think, that differentiation doesn't stop when you're born. It continues throughout your life. And that means there are a lot of moments when differences between people can happen. So of course, there are a ton of different outcomes. We tend to put these outcomes into two boxes based on visible anatomy, or what scientists call phenotypes. Phenotypical males have testicles and a penis, while phenotypical females have ovaries, a uterus, a vagina, and vulva. But in reality, none of the traits we use to discriminate between the sexes are truly binary. There's a lot of variation. Hang on, I just want to pause to take this super chat from uh, Murphy's Pool. Thank you for that. If there is no biological determinationism, are they saying being gay is a choice and not innate? Murphy's Pool, that is an excellent question. Because it kind of does seem like the only way that there can be no biological determinism is also saying that being gay is a choice, which I don't think being gay is a choice. I think you like what you like, but it kind of seems like that's the only logical conclusion that can be drawn here. Really astute observation, Murphy's Pool. Thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it within what we call male or female, and there's a lot of overlap that's normal too. Anatomically, someone might look phenotypically female on the outside, but not have ovaries or a uterus, or have oh. tissues from both ovaries. I just want to do a quick pause, and thank you, Kenneth, over on Rockfin for the tip. I do appreciate it, Kenneth. Let me just see if uh, Kenneth says, great commentary, great content and commentary as always. I really do appreciate everyone watching over on Rockfin. Thank you, guys and testes. And genetics aren't any clearer, because when it comes to chromosomes, people don't always just get two X's or an X and a Y. X's and Y's contain genes that help determine sex, with the Y chromosome conferring the genes that enable you to develop male reproductive parts. But the processes for producing sperm and eggs are really complicated, and they can lead to lots of different results. In this process, abbreviated version, specialized cells basically duplicate themselves, then undergo two rounds of division to produce reproductive cells, or gametes, that have half of the parent's genetic material. So it makes one set of 23 chromosomes. But sometimes the chromosomes don't split into exact sets of 23, and that means there are a whole bunch of possible combinations of X's and Y's that a person can end up with. For instance, people can inherit three X's, or an X and two Y's. These folks are normally taller than average. Those with three X's have slender builds and 
can sometimes have minor learning disorders. The people who have an X and two Ys, on the other hand, tend to have more acne because of the extra testosterone in their systems. In both cases, people retain full fertility. Then there's Turner syndrome, which happens <laughs> when you just get one Illustration X. Station. That results in female characteristics, but the people who have it tend to be shorter, don't really go through puberty, and may have mental disabilities and are sterile. And Klinefelter syndrome, which results from two X's and a Y, is the most common chromosomal sex anomaly. It happens in one in 600 male births and can cause lower testosterone production and cause incomplete testicular development, though the symptoms can be Hang on, I want to pause for the super chat from Kino in a My Cousin Vinny voice. Everything this guy says is bullshit. Exactly. But he's reading that script so well. Well, and Vince is bringing up a, a great point, too. Now, if if they're saying, if these people are arguing that being gay is a choice, which it does, I don't believe that. But it does sound like they believe that then there's nothing inherently wrong with conversion therapy, which I, again, would disagree. I don't think conversion therapy is a good idea, but if it's a choice, then is it really conversion? You know, so many questions. So many questions when you play out this ideology to its logical conclusion minor enough that a person isn't diagnosed until later in life. Now, there's also the fact that all your cells in your body don't necessarily have the same chromosomal makeup, which like, what? Did I learn nothing but lies in high school? But it's true. Someone with mosaicism can develop from a single fertilized egg but have a patchwork of genetically different cells. And someone who's a genetic chimera has different cells because they develop from two different fertilized eggs that merge in the womb. In both cases, it's possible to end up with a mix of cells with different sex chromosomes. And depending on the distribution of those cells, mosaicism and chimerism can result in ambiguous sexual characteristics characteristics or both male and female reproductive body parts. It's even been shown that pregnant people and their fetuses frequently pregnant swap people. stem cells through the placenta in a phenomenon known as microchimerism. That means a chromosomal female can be carrying around XY cells and her son can have XX ones. In some studies, these cells have been shown to stick around in the Thank mother for size. several decades. But all that said, there are also plenty of people with double X or XY chromosomes that also have differences of sexual development. That's in part because at least 25 genes play a role in sex differentiation. So both mutations and relocations of these genes can result in a range of differences. Genes necessary for male development can be swapped onto the X chromosome, for example, or someone can end up with multiple or mutated versions of other sex-determining genes. And some of these are on other chromosomes and are inherited as run-of-the-mill recessive traits. All of these genes really start to be influential around six weeks of development. You see, at six weeks, the fetus has a pair of bulges called the gonadal ridges what? next to its kidneys. And they have the potential to develop into ovaries or testes. The fetus at this point also has two sets of ducts. One set can develop into the uterus and fallopian tubes, while the other set has the potential to become the epididymis, vas deferens, and seminal vesicles. And what happens from there is somewhat of a balancing act of different genes working in concert. Essentially, different networks of genes shout male and female, and when that balance gets knocked slightly askew, it can move a person along the sex spectrum. Take SRY, discovered in the 1990s. This is the male programming gene, and it has a big effect on development. If it ends up on the chromosome of someone who is XX... I, I was not good in science in school. Just so, like, people are like, I, I was not good at science in school. Science was my least favorite subject. And I kind of right now feel like I'm back in biology class when I'm just like, I didn't know what was going on then. I mean, I'm not a biologist. So maybe, maybe all the alleged biologists are right that this is all really a spectrum. And, and I just, I just suck at science. And so I'm just too stupid to understand. But this is really sounding like a long winded way of, is this a long-winded way of saying that everyone is really non-binary? <laughs> I mean, really? Like, that's what I'm watching, right? Can, can like, someone correct me if I'm wrong? I mean, I'm sure one of you in the chat must know science. Like, is this really just a long-winded, overtly complicated way of saying that everyone is really non-binary?
let's all just act as if mutations are normative. I mean, it does sound kind of like they're doing that. Yeah. The biological development that describes a, of a, that describes of a phoenix is correct. Well, okay, but like, it kind of makes it seem like like they're trying to make everyone non-binary, and they're like, you know, we all have the same parts. Everything is exactly the same. And, you know, you might go a little bit this way or you might go a little bit that way. And if you knock something out of whack, then you go a little bit more this way or a little bit more that way. But really, sex is just a spectrum. We're really all the same. That kind of is what I'm getting out of this. I mean, we've got like, you know, eight minutes left or so. I don't know. It can cause them to develop testes instead of ovaries. This can happen because there's a step in sperm and egg production when chromosomes swap some DNA with their partner chromosomes. And even though the X and Y chromosomes generally don't join in on this DNA swapping process, they sometimes do. Plus, other mutations that occur during See, the production of gametes can result in multiple or mutated versions of SRY or other sex-determining genes because it's not the only gene that matters. There are also genes that actively encourage the fetus to develop female characteristics. For instance, the gene WINT4 suppresses testicular development and promotes ovarian this development, is just way too and confusing. multiple copies of it can cause incomplete female gonads to develop in people who are XY. Gonad development also triggers the production of sex-specific hormones, which results in further sex-specific development. But some people have differences of sex differentiation that limit their ability to respond to those hormones. Complete androgen insensitivity Activity syndrome is one of these. People who have it are unaffected by- To be really clear, I'm not actually questioning the scientific accuracy of any of this. What I'm saying is that the way they are describing it is meant to A, be really confusing to people watching it. B, it's also meant to basically get people to think this is just a giant spectrum. That's all it is. We're giving you a lot of information, but what we really want you to know is this is a spectrum and a little bit this way, a little bit that way. And all of these things can affect whether or not you go a little bit this way or a little bit that way. And so I'm not questioning the scientific accuracy of it. I'm questioning the narrative and how they are describing things and what they what the ultimate understanding that they want people to have is. Does that make sense? male sex hormones because they have some kind of mutation to the protein that these hormones bind to called the androgen receptor. And that means that while they have testes and a Y chromosome, their exterior genitals appear female or in between. There's also congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the exactly, most common Mark. DSD out there. Truth, and that's and when the adrenal glands underproduce cortisol and overproduce androgens, the male hormone group that includes testosterone. The underproduction of cortisol can lead to health problems while exactly. the Overproduction exactly. of androgens can lead to exactly. external male genitalia paired with internal female gonads in people with XX chromosomes. He's basically describing a lot of mutations and things that are like outside of what we might consider to be like, quote unquote, normal. And then he's making it seem as though that's representative of everything in order to make the mutations seem like it's normal biological development. Some of these conditions don't fully present themselves until puberty or later. In fact, some aren't realized at all until a person seeks some kind of medical care that reveals them. Like in 2014, doctors reported one case of a 70-year-old father of four whose, quote, hernia turned out to be a uterus with fallopian tubes. But in many cases, differences in sexual development are notable from birth. For those newborns, it may be possible to assign a gender based on what they're more likely to identify as as they grow up. The thing is, with all of the things that can happen during sexual development, when a child is born with an obvious difference of sex development, it's not always clear why. Thank Looking at chromosomes side. often isn't enough, and sometimes a hormonal test isn't either. And even if the child's doctors have 
have a sense of what's going on, determining what, if any, treatment is necessary can be challenging. Back in the 1960s, it was thought that growing up without clearly defined sexual organs would cause I'm emotional trauma. Not sure what to make trauma. of that, emphasize So I'm there was a push it. towards performing surgery on infants to clearly assign them a sex. And because of social stigmas surrounding DSDs, parents were often encouraged to keep all of this a secret, even from the child. So people grew up without knowing kind of important details about their own bodies. It's hard to get numbers on how many of these surgeries were or even are being performed. It's also hard to know exactly how these surgeries affect patients. But as adults, many report pain, scarring, and a loss of sensation. Also, people with DSDs do report high rates of gender dysphoria, where their chosen gender does not align with their assigned sex. And there's an association between gender dysphoria and mental health issues like self-harm behaviors, so these surgeries may contribute to mental health problems later in life. Though, it's important to note that such issues are less likely if people have supportive and affirming parents who accept them as they are. And sometimes surgery is medically necessary, like to unblock the urethra. Also, surgery can help to preserve fertility, or in the case of complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, to reduce the risk of testicular cancer. But from a medical perspective, those surgeries don't need to be performed on infants. In fact, most of the time, differences in genital anatomy at birth aren't something that needs to be fixed. At least not until the person is old enough to make their own choices about what they want their bodies to look like. So nowadays, healthcare is moving away from a surgical approach. If a DSD is identified at birth, treatment is more likely to include therapy and hormonal replacement than surgery. Often, a DSD team is involved in care, which can include geneticists, endocrinologists, and Thank psychologists or psychiatrists. They help the family decide if any interventions are immediately and medically necessary, and help provide care and support to the child with DSD and their family throughout childhood. Unfortunately, this kind of care still isn't available everywhere. For now, researchers are working to better understand the development of both sex and gender over time, and to gain a clearer sense of when kids begin to understand their own gender identity. The problem, of course, is the fact that from clothes to restrooms to organized sports, they are raised in a society that is set up around a binary, that just isn't binary. But researchers are thinking about how we can make our overall discussions and understanding of sex even more inclusive and more accurate. Because even though biological sex may seem like one of those things that is relatively straightforward in a very, very complicated world, it's not. And while there's probably still a long way to go to understand it, we are making progress. Before we go, we'd like to give a special thank you to our patrons on Patreon. It's because of their support that we're able to tackle complex- Yeah, thank you, Patreon. What the fuck was that? I, I feel like I've been put through the ringer in the course of this video. And it, the, the title of the video is Science Proves There's More Than Two Human Sexes. And this is being, this how we got to this video for people who just joined is this is on a website all about gender inclusive biology that is being taught to your kids in school. What was that? That was like a roller coaster. That was a tour de force. I have no idea what we just watched, but I know it wasn't good. All right, let's 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 choose a couple others. Let's see. What should we do next? Well, let's do the TED Talk. Fine, let's do the TED Talk. The way we think about biological sex is wrong. Emily Quinn, an intersex activist, delivered a 14-minute TED Talk at the TED Women event in 2000, 2018. Emily tells her personal story. I don't know. I don't want to hear a personal story. I'm sorry. I don't want to hear a personal story about intersex people. Intersex people are a very, 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 very tiny percent of the population. And though I fully expect respect their ability to exist and like, you know, have basic respect and courtesy like everyone else. I don't want to watch a video about their life. I'm sorry. That might make me bigoted against intersex people. I have no idea. I just don't want to watch a personal anecdote. That's not the point of this. Let's see. Uh, I don't want to watch the secrets of the X chromosome. Well, let's do our male and female brains different. Oh, another sci show. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, excellent. 
Lord, help us. Pray for me. Someone say a prayer right now if you believe in God. I think we've all heard this saying, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. The implication being that they are just completely, totally, fundamentally distinct. So say you picked up a male Hang brain. On. YouTube is doing this thing again where it's not going full screen like I want it to. Hang on. I apologize. YouTube is being wonky right now. I don't know why. I really don't know if I can do another one of these, but okay, we're going to do it. Come on, full screen. I literally just full screened you, YouTube. Why aren't you working? We had a deal, YouTube. I pressed the button. You did what you were supposed to do. No. I think we. It is not working today. Kino says, how many flowers are consumed after streams like this? You know, we don't want to talk about that, Kino. I have another stream later today, all right? I would never do such a thing, Kino. I just really want this stream to go for the video to go full screen. That's all I want at the moment. Full screen, mother effer. Ah, there we go. I think we've all heard this saying, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. The implication being that they are just completely, totally, fundamentally distinct. Obviously. So say you picked up a male brain and a female brain and compared them. Like you squeezed. The reason that I'm not using Brave is that you can't hear the sound when I use Brave. There is a reason that I'm doing it the way I am. It is not my ideal way to do it. It is just simply the way the streaming software works. Everyone's going to have to deal with it. I'm sorry. I mean, you poke them and prod them, and this is kind of a gross example. I don't think we should be playing with brains. Put the brains down. The question is, if you looked at a male and female brain side by side, would you be able to see any differences? Well, the answer is super controversial, and you probably wouldn't be able to tell with the naked eye, but like, Maybe? The better question is, would it even matter if you could? Now, it's important to note that we're talking about biological sex here, not gender. Almost all of the studies on brain anatomy have been done with people whose gender identity aligns with the sex they were assigned with at birth, which means we can't really apply their results to people with other gender identities. Same for people who are intersex, meaning their chromosomes or reproductive anatomy don't fit the typical binary. With that in mind, though, we can ask whether there are fundamental differences in brain anatomy between biosex males and females. And there are a lot of good reasons to ask that. Outdated stereotypes like the idea that males are better at math aren't one of them. But there are differences between males and females that are pretty well supported. For instance, females are more frequently diagnosed with disorders like depression and anxiety and have higher rates of Alzheimer's. Biological differences in the brain, if they exist, could help explain and treat these diseases. And then there's the fact that most of science just doesn't use female animal models. A 2010 study of sex bias and research found that neuroscience was one of the guiltiest fields and that male animals were studied more than five times as often as female animals. There are reasons for this, including the fact that lab mice go into heat every four to six days. I mean, if you thought PMS once a month was bad, try factoring that kind of hormonal haywire into your nicely controlled scientific experiment. But if human male and female brains are lie? different, then not studying female oh. animal models is a pretty big problem. Problem. So are sex-related anatomical differences a thing or not? Well, yes and no. The one consistent finding is that male brains are bigger on average than female ones. Which makes sense because generally, male heads are bigger. Bigger bodies, bigger body parts. Oh, Other studies wait, suggest wait, that there wait, are differences. Wait, wait. Are, are you suggesting that men have bigger bodies? Is that what I'm hearing? Is he suggesting that men have bigger some might argue stronger bodies as a as part of their natural innate biology huh huh brooklyn says carlin he said that studies have not been done on people who identify as he drew a distinction between biology and identity but would not say that identity has no bearing on it i'm not sure i would say that's a lie I mean, I don't know. Maybe studies haven't been done.
factors in specific brain regions, or that for females, some regions have thicker cortices, the folded gray matter on the outer edge of the brain that we use to do our higher level cognition. But findings vary by study, and all of them depend on whether or not you correct for the larger size of the male brain overall. When you do, some of the results disappear, and some stay the same, and some even flip which sex is larger. Though again, different studies have had different results. And whether or not to do that kind of size correction is still hotly debated by scientists. Some researchers point out that larger brain structures are still larger brain structures no matter what size your body is. Those extra neurons gotta be doing something, right? And we make all this fuss about our brains being bigger than those of other primates, because we assume that size matters. But it's not like we think sperm whales are vastly more intelligent than we are, even though their brains are more than six times the size of ours. So most studies investigating behaviors or disease conditions look at the relative size instead. Indeed, the very fact that a lot of sex differences disappear once you correct for relative head size suggests that maybe it's worth taking a second look at. For example, a 2018 study, which is perhaps the most comprehensive to date, looked at the brains of 2,750 females and 2,466 males and found that anatomical differences did exist and were statistically significant. On so if that's true, if that's true, let me just go back slightly so you can see. If that's no, that's not where I wanted to stop. There it is. If it is true that a 2018 study, which is perhaps the most comprehensive today, looked at the brains of 2,700 male or females and 2,400 males and found that there are anatomical differences and they did exist and they are statistically significant, then why can't we develop a a test based on biology, based on science, to tell us whether or not someone is transgender. If 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 trans people exist, and I would say they do, I think I think that that's pretty clear. Then the argument for gender dysphoria, transgender people is that there is something biologically different about their brain in which their brain develops differently than their body. Okay, fine. But if we are now seeing a study that says that there is a statistically significant difference between the brains of biological females and biological males, then why can't they develop some sort of test based on science to test someone to see if their brain more closely resembles a biological female or a biological male. That would seem to clear up a lot of the confusion, to be really honest. If they could develop some sort of test to say, yes, you are trans and we're going to put you on this course of therapy and we're going to transition your gender because you are trans and that's just the way it is based on what we can see and how your brain is developed, that would actually t cure a lot of the problems that are happening right now. On average, females had thicker cortices in 48 of the 68 brain regions examined, but males had larger brains and larger brain regions and structures. When the size of the brain was accounted for, though, the sex differences and the size of most of these regions disappeared. So did the size differences in structures, like the hippocampus, caudate nucleus, and thalamus. And females ended up having larger relative volumes for 10 regions, as well as the right nucleus accumbens. But the differences in size of these structures absolute or relative, were small, and there was a lot of overlap. So if a particular structure was really big or really small, it might be associated with a particular sex. But plenty of different sizes for a given structure could be considered totally normal for males or females. And previous studies had found that while there are average differences between the sexes, individuals don't necessarily have male or female brains. Researchers in a 2015 study of 281 brains found that back. individuals like, often have like a quote-unquote mosaic of male-ish and female-ish brain characteristics rather than they were seriously just like there are different there are statistical differences between male and female brains but no there aren't differences between males and females like are you kidding me i mean that's what it said right hang on let me go back and just see because they breezed by it real quick 
No, that's not what I wanted. No. Previous studies have found that while there are average differences between sexes, individuals don't necessarily... That doesn't make sense. You just said earlier in the video that there are statistically significant differences between biological female brains and biological male brains. And now you're saying that, no, no, we're taking it back. No, 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 we don't, we don't really mean it. You guys have to take a position. Either there are statistically significant differences based on science, or there are not statistically significant differences based on science. Make up your damn minds. Jewels don't necessarily have male or female brains. Researchers in a 2015 study of 281 brains found that individuals often have like a quote-unquote mosaic of male-ish and female-ish brain characteristics rather than all their structures tending toward one sex. What conclusion can be drawn from all of this? Well, despite all the controversy, there might be some small differences on average between male and female brains. And that does kind of make sense. After all, males and females have different chromosomes and are are exposed to a different set of hormones both prenatally and throughout our entire lives. Despite that, though, a lot of social psychologists and sociologists point out that it's impossible to know how much of these sex differences come from biology and how much come from environmental oh influences. My God, there the brain it is. is famous for being plastic. And this is like gender is socially constructed, gender isn't real, it's your environment after all. And it makes sense that if playing video games alters your brain, how you were raised and treated and act alters your brain too. But there's also an assumption underlying all this debate, which is rarely questioned, that these differences correlate to sex-specific differences in cognition or behavior. The thing is, there's not much evidence that that's true. And there might be a reason for that. One interesting theory some psychologists have is that size does matter, but that the anatomical differences between the sexes compensate for any cognitive differences that might otherwise arise because of sizing. So that relatively large right nucleus accumbens or the thicker cortices of females don't make them act or think differently than males, it ensures they don't, despite the male's larger noggins. And even if size does matter, bigger isn't necessarily better. There simply isn't a lot of evidence that actually connects anatomical differences in brains to behavior or cognition, unless you're talking about things like malformations, lesions, or serious brain damage. And remember phrenology? That super cool trend in the 1800s of using the lumps and bumps on a person's head to make judgments about their thoughts and personality? Yeah, that one made everybody look silly. So as usual, there's a lot more work to be done to figure out what all this means. But for now, you can be pretty skeptical of anyone trying to use brain anatomy to justify any argument about differences between oh the sexes. Oh my god, are you shitting me? Are you shitting me? You literally just said earlier in the video that there was a statistically significant difference between male brains and female brains, and now at the end of the video, because you've, you've, you've thrown enough information that you've tried to confuse people, you're saying... You know, just because that study we cited earlier said there was no difference, or excuse me, said there was a difference between male brains and female brains, you can still be pretty, pretty skeptical of anyone who tries to convince you that male brains and female brains are different. They contradicted themselves within the own, their own effing video. Like, you guys know this guy is just reading a script, right? This guy doesn't know about any of this stuff, I'm betting. He's reading whatever is given to him. Wow. This 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 guys is funded with your taxpayer dollars. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, let's go back. Let's see is there anything else we want to watch? I kind of want to watch that crocodile video, I'm not going to lie. I've been watching a lot of alligator and crocodile videos lately. Like so let's let's watch this as like a final final wrap up. Is is he really is that true? Or are you guys lying? All right. The crocodile's unusual determination system explained. Well, obviously, the female brain is better emphasized. That is obviously and clearly true. Let's watch about crocodiles. This video from Facts in Motion illustrates how the sex of crocodiles is determined by environments and not by genetics. The sex ratio of developing crocodile eggs is shown to be a function of temperature thought to be mediated by a therm thermosensor protein. Climate change may impact or even cause the extinction of crocodiles. I don't want I don't want crocodiles to go to extinct. 
The sex determination system is not so unusual because it occurs in other reptiles and fish species. It is certainly interesting in gathering attention. The College Board's 2018 AP Biology exam had a free response question about a temperature-dependent sex determination in fish. All right, let's learn about crocodiles. And I'm going to pause this to get it full screen. Is this another one from the side? Nope, back to the motion. Okay, hang on. Full screen. Oh, perfect. First try. All right. A. The building blocks of life. Everything that makes you who you are, physically, is determined by your genes. How tall you are, what color your eyes have, or that your one leg is slightly shorter than the other. Even your sex is decided at the very moment the sperm cell enters the egg by your sex chromosomes. This mechanism is, by evolutionary standards, surprisingly simple. Two X chromosomes so much more pleasant make a girl, than the last one. an X and a Y, a boy. In most animals, sex determination works exactly like this, or in a very similar way. Look, it even is but embracing the exceptions. gender binary. Crocodiles and alligators, for example. They don't have sex chromosomes. But that leaves the question, what makes a crocodile male and what female? That's what we are going to find out in this episode of Facts in Motion. I watch a lot of okay, this is this is a fun fact. In my in my spare time when I'm flicking through like Instagram and stuff like that, I watch a lot of alligator training videos for some reason. I don't really know why. I just started watching them a while ago and then I couldn't stop because the alligators act like dogs. I was kind of like this is kind of interesting alligators act like dogs. Who would have thought it? And um and 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 one of the things I've noticed about the female alligators is that the female alligators are uppity and they try to bite and they jump and the male alligators are more chill and they just like you know they're they're pretty the male alligators are pretty effing lazy and they expect everything to be done for them but the female alligators are usually feisty and they're more likely to go up and like jump at you I don't know I hear female brain is better at being coerced. I wouldn't say that. Emphasize. Thank you. Sex determination of crocodiles and alligators. Hope you enjoy. Like most reptiles, crocodiles lay eggs. Thus, as the time for egg deposition approaches around four to six weeks after mating, female crocodiles must leave the water to construct a nest. Depending on the species, the nest will either be a hole in the ground or a mound of grass, leaves and sticks. The female will deposit about 40 to 60 eggs inside the nest Jesus and cover Christ. them. 40 to this 60 will eggs. keep the eggs humid, somewhat protected from predators and rising waters, and most importantly, at a stable temperature. The right temperature is key for the development of most life forms on Earth. But for crocodiles and other crocodilians, it is especially important. That is because they display so-called temperature-dependent sex determination, or TSD in short, which means that the temperature of the developing eggs determines the individual's sex. Only if agree, the right I'm average surprised, temperature you, during a critical period, roughly halfway through the embryonic development, is reached, can the embryo become male. For crocodiles, this key temperature is 31.5 degrees Celsius. Incubation at lower temperatures will produce only females. Incubation at a higher temperature will produce an almost all male brood. Particularly high temperatures in this case, over 34.5 degrees Celsius, however, will produce female hatchlings once again. The molecular and physiological mechanisms underlying this process are still fairly unknown. However, recently it could be shown that the process might be significantly influenced by thermosensor proteins. Proteins such as TRPV4 that is only responsive to specific temperatures near the mid-30s and will only then activate the necessary genes to inhibit the creation of a female reproductive system and promote the development of male sexual organs. For most TSD systems, small changes in temperature can make a huge difference. A change of one degree or less can already cause dramatic changes in sex ratio. That is why female crocodiles have to choose their nesting sites wisely. 
both to warm and to cold places will likely produce a majority of females. To ensure that at least some eggs have the right temperature to produce males, crocodiles borrow their eggs in layers. Oh, Because temperatures vary from the top of the nest to the bottom, this will guarantee that the brood will give rise to individuals of both sexes. Smart crocodiles. In some years, however, when the weather is particularly hot, even this technique won't prevent an all-female brood. This isn't too worrisome if it happens occasionally, but if it becomes the norm, then the lack of male hatchlings could have a serious impact on the crocodile population. And because scientists generally agree that the planet is warming and will continue to do so for decades to come oh, due there to it global is. warming, we could see many crocodile populations decreasing even further than they already Climate are. Climate change ruins Possibly everything to the point again. Weather vanish entirely. Climate so change far, is going however, to, to this get rid of the alligator. Yet, as not a single species of alligators or crocodiles went extinct. Not in the last few hundred years anyway. And so female crocodiles will continue to guard their nests against predators, unaware of the possible doom that grows within it. And when the 90-day incubation period is over and the babies begin to hatch and call for their mother, she will rush out of the water back to her nest to take it apart and free her babies. The ones that can't get out of the eggs on their own, she will assist by cracking open the shells with a gentle bite of her powerful jaws before carrying all of them back to the water. But her maternal duties are not over even now. She will stand guard over her brood for the next few months, till they are big enough to survive on their own. All right. That was probably the best video that we watched, because at least that video, although it got a little woke with climate change, at least that video believed in the gender binary. And so I guess that's something. That was kind of interesting that, uh, that, uh, that whether or not you're a male or female crocodile depends on the the heat let's see what else do we have reading for students again guys we're looking at queer biology class remember thomas the blind bisexual goose oh by the way i learned in watching my alligator training videos that alligators can be gay because recently the the person that i watched his name is gator boy chris he posted a video of of how alligators mate and there was a gay couple so apparently alligators can be gay too queer animals are everywhere science is finally catching on we already read that that inclusive uh that gender queer one from for animals See, here's another one that, that contradicts that video we saw earlier. You don't have a male brain or a female brain. The more brain scientists studies, the weaker the evidence for sex differences. Oh, the WHO. Who and gender and genetics. What is this? The World Health Organization has a concise but comprehensive overview of the relationship between genetics, sex, and gender. This website presents an overview for major ethical, legal, and social implications associated with gender and genetics. This research, this website is a useful resource for students researching sex and gender in the context of genetics or health. Oh, oh, <laughs> you know what? Thank heaven for small favors. <laughs> Beth says, do you know the difference between alligators and crocodiles? Apparently, apparently one you will see later and the other one will see you in a while. I could be wrong. I'm not a zoologist. Crocodiles are much bigger. They're also much meaner and they have a pointier nose. Alligators are lazy. <laughs> Let me see. What else do we have? Oh, there's uh, Arizona Senator right there, I think. That's nice. Educator Guides. Framework for Gender Inclusive Biology. A framework first appeared in Sam's article, Growing a Gender Inclusive Biology Curriculum, a Framework and Reflections for Secondary Science Teachers. In The Assembly, a journal for public scholarship on education hosted at the University of Colorado at Boulder. It's kind of like all of this stuff is out of the University of Colorado at Boulder. 
what the holy hell is going on at the University of Colorado at Boulder? It has an evolving set of principles for teachers reflecting on ways to expand their curriculum for more inclusion. The five principles below present guiding details for your own thinking. We should contact them for more materials if they if, to discuss uh, gender inclusive biology. Authent okay, the five principles for gender inclusion in biology class. Authenticity, embed gender inclusion in the curriculum, reflect on our own knowledge and comfort level with the topic, align lessons with our own developing understanding of gender and sex diversity, use empiric scientific research to inform consent, not political agendas. Well, it kind of seems to me like this whole website is a political agenda. I don't know. Encourage students, students to question their assumptions and explain in different ways. Continuity. Gender inclusion is a recurring part of the curriculum, not a one-time lesson, an extension or a reaction to an interaction. Do it, Joseph. Do it. We don't judge here. I understand. Oh, Westcott, congratulations, Westcott. You're paying for this with your taxes. I hope you feel good about that. We appreciate your contribution. Themes of gender inclusion are consistent from lesson to lesson. All lessons in biology class must have gender inclusion. Begin units with diversity lens rather than oversimplifying and reworking details later. Consistently include gender where applicable as one of the themes and lenses for analysis. Refrain from highlighting or tokenizing gender in a one-time lesson extension or reaction to behavior. No very special lens. Students are taught a more complex truth rather than an oversimplification rule. Well, one of the things we learned being owed is that mushrooms are non-binary. We learned that at the beginning of the stream. So be careful with whatever mushrooms you're interacting with because they're non-binary. Be respectful of their gender. Affirmation. Students learn about the naturally occurring diversity of gender and sexuality in human and non-human species. Units are framed with diversity first rather than oversimplifying and filling in more details later. Celebrate diversity as a valuable asset for surviving and thriving in societies among scientists. Bot has found Natasha's Twitter. We'll take a look at that in a second. Thank you, Bot. Oh! Oh! <laughs> I'm blocked. Natasha has blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> That's okay, Natasha. Like, I'll show you. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'll show you. Hang on. <laughs> Look, I'm blocked by Natasha on Twitter. Oh, wait, you can't see. Hang on. Hang on. This is our scientist that we were watching earlier. That's okay, Natasha. That's okay. Don't have I blocked Natasha or was this a preemptive block? Yep, this is I haven't blocked her, but she's blocked me. So we're gonna go ahead. Guys, pro tip. Always block people that block you. But Natasha, that's okay because I have like 86 Twitter accounts. <laughs> And I can just look you up in a different Twitter account, love. Now, I wasn't even that interested in what you had to say before, Natasha, but the fact that you've blocked me on Twitter makes me, makes me question what's going on. Julie says, growing up in Denver, we used to call Boulder eight square miles surrounded by reality. That's a really good saying, Julie. I appreciate it. All right, so we've got our curriculum. I don't. I'm, you guys get the idea. I'm. I now want to know what's going on in Ta Natasha's Twitter. So just give me one sec. I'm going to get set up on my super secret Twitter. I just gotta make sure you guys can't see the name of it because I don't want it getting out. Well, actually, no. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna log in under the unwoke art Twitter. Just in case, because the uh, horde of merry idiots know the unwoke art Twitter, and so that won't be a surprise if it automatically, if it accidentally gets shown on the screen. There we go. I'm into the unwoke art Twitter. Let me just copy Natasha's. Now, if Natasha has blocked this Twitter, I will be 
extraordinarily impressed with Natasha because this is a brand new Twitter account. No, she hasn't. All right. Hi, Natasha. It's nice to meet you, Natasha. There she is. Let's see what's going on on Nat Natasha's Twitter. Let's see. Guys, pro tip on Twitter. When you're looking at someone... Oh, she's got everyone blocked. Natasha must use a block list. That's okay. She probably blocked everyone following James Lindsay or some such shit. So, guys, when you're on Twitter and you're you're trying to research someone, um, go. don't just look at their tweets. You want to go over here to replies. Replies are oftentimes where you're going to get the most interesting information about what people are tweeting about. Let's see. Just scrolling through. What is this? Mermaids? Supporting kids and gender diverse children? What the hell? 108,000 followers? We'll look at that later. Hang on. They think that Sports Illustrated is anti-trans. Okay. The BBC has received more than 2,000 complaints over bias in favor of conservatives. You've got to be kidding me. Natasha must be in the UK. Evangelicals are a bigger threat to Western democracies than ISIS. That's nice of her. Th that's like a British commentator, isn't she? I'm pretty sure, isn't she like a British, like, media personality? So Natasha just retweets a lot, apparently, which is fine. I would like to see what she has to say. Yeah, Mermaids is a UK thing. Oh, there's Chloe Cole. The New York Times published a reported story about detransition, focusing on how uh, few anti-trans detransition de activists there are and how they don't seem to represent the views of most people who detransition. Oh, they're smearing, uh, they're smearing children. Oh, that's that's really great, New York Times. Excellent work. Smearing kids who have had body parts cut off always seems like a good idea for the New York Times. All right. Doesn't really look like there's anything crazy here. It's mostly UK stuff. And no offense to people that are in the UK, but I just don't care about you as much. Let's look at this. She's got a thread. Let's look at the thread. It is a common tactic amongst politicians. And the farther right you go, the more common it becomes to conflate the two main meanings of words similar to mistake. Words or phrases like error, slip up, muck up, mess up, blunder, accident. There are two meanings to these words, one of which is widely used, uh, widely used. The other is less commonly used, except by politicians, ex especially on the extreme right. So error, accident, slip up, blunder, muck up, etc. are commonly understood as meaning something inadvertent, like spilling your tea, blah, blah, blah. The other way, the, the what, what is her point? I don't know. UK politics thing. I've already lost interest in this. All right, guys, that's all we're going to do today. I hope has everyone enjoyed their jaunt into queer biology. You know, who else is showing you queer biology on the Internet? I, I think I'm pretty much probably the only person that's done something like this. But anyway, guys, this is not my last stream of the day, but it is my first stream of the day. And just as a reminder, please come back and join us at 930 p.m. tonight. And we're going to do something a lot more fun, which is our weekly show. Nothing remotely controversial with me and Joshua. Joshua is a professional psychic in real life. And we take your questions and we talk about what is going on in the world and the news and all that stuff. And then Joshua. Joshua uses his psychic powers to help us predict what's going on. It is a lighthearted look at the news. It is fun. It is laid back. It, it allows us to blow off some steam. 
even if you don't believe in psychics, you can still come and join us. That's going to be on the channel at 930 tonight. I'm going to go take a little break and get some dinner. And if you don't join us for nothing remotely controversial uh, later tonight, I will be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. And in the meantime, please make sure you head over to my Substack, carlin.substack.com. Make sure you're subscribed. I do appreciate it. Guys, that's all I have for today. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Bye.